Okay, I got 702. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to the second in our series of uh, referee education webinars. Um, I'm Wayne Jackson, Washington SDA, and I'm going to be your moderator for this evening's uh, session. Um, for you that missed uh, last week, uh, last week's webinar with Mo, uh, how they, uh, what to do when the game changes. Uh, <clears throat> You can uh, go to uh, our Washington's uh, referees homepage and same place where you've had uh, saw the information about these webinars. You will see kind of what I've outlined in the, uh, the red circle. Uh, that is last week's uh, session with Mo about when the game changes. And if you click on the underlined um, uh, hyperlink, it will take you to YouTube, a YouTube channel where you can view uh, Mo's presentation in its entirety. So, and we're going to continue to do that uh, for subsequent tonight's session and subsequent uh, sessions so you can go back and look at them or if you can't uh, participate for whatever reason, uh, you, they will be uh, come available to you. So hopefully we'll have tomorrow, uh, tonight's session available tomorrow afternoon. Um, Some kind of some ground rules again for uh, tonight's session. Uh, we are going to record it. That's so we can, uh, you know, play it back and have it streamed uh, for you. Uh, so everybody, please uh, mute uh, your mic and, um, and no videos, please. Um, this will help us increase the bandwidth and also um, uh, improve the quality of the uh, videos for this evening. Uh, if you have questions uh, or want to, you know, ask something, please don't unmute yourself. Just go ahead and use the chat box, and we'll try to monitor those uh, throughout the uh, the session this evening. Uh, additionally, there will be a couple of polls uh, during the session. Uh, we encourage you to participate in those. Uh, you're going to be anonymous, so nobody's going to call you out for your answer or anything. And then, time permitting, we'll have. Um, Maybe we have a question or two at the uh, at the end, and our goal also is to uh, give a feedback summary um, and so ask you for some feedback on our sessions and what we can improve and so forth. So, uh, getting into tonight's session uh, about positioning and restarts, um, here's some images of our presenter tonight, uh, Katja Korleva. Um, I found my uh, 2018 OSI guide, and there she is on the cover. Uh, and then uh, there's a couple images of her. I think it was in a game with uh, Brazil, uh, uh, just to show you a little bit uh, about uh, her image on the field. And if you saw her on Saturday night, uh, she did the um, Chicago uh, game versus Washington uh, in the uh, NS NWSL Challenge Cup. So for you that are not familiar with uh, Katja, uh, here's a little bi uh, bio on her. Uh, she started doing professional games back in 2013. She's done the NWSL. Uh, she's a pro referee. She's done some MLS, VAR. Uh, she's, you've seen her probably at Starfire or down at Tacoma with the USL games. Uh, she was appointed to the FIFA panel in 2014. And she's not just a FIFA referee, she's one of the best FIFA referees uh, anywhere. Uh, in 2016, uh, she was involved in the uh, U-17 World Cup in Jordan. And in 18, uh, she went all the way to Uruguay with the same U-17 World Cup. Uh, and most recently, in, she was in France last year at the uh, Women's World Cup, and I think she got four assignments there. Uh, which is fantastic. And then most recently, this year, I uh, was involved in the uh, CONCACAF uh, Olympic qualifiers. Um, that's the professional side that we know as the FIFA Katja, but you, uh, I picked this image up off the uh, LA Times. And her other life, she's a physician's assistant, and she's been on the front line uh, during the COVID uh, pan pandemic that we have here. So this is what she looks like when she's uh, not wearing a referee uniform. So we're very, very pleased to have Katja as our moderator this evening and our presenter, keynote presenter. And uh, I'm gonna turn the uh, program over to her. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and Katja is gonna be yours here. Yeah. 
Thank you very, uh, thank very much. Thank you for the introduction, Wayne. Um, certainly, um, I'm happy to be here. I want to take this opportunity to share information that I've learned and um, hopefully give you guys an insight of um, gaining some importance positioning um, lessons as it comes to set pieces. Um, so let's start off with our objective. So in the set pieces, we want to find uh, optimal position during stoppage of play to see in between players with an ideal proximity to intervene and manage and really prepare ourselves for the next phase. So that will be our objective for the next 45 minutes or so. I will hopefully have time at the end to uh, go over some questions um, if there are any um, and from there. So key concepts that I want you all to keep in mind uh, when we talk about positioning as it relates to general positioning as well as set pieces is the best position is really a position that's unique to every situation and it enables us to make um, the correct decision. So this is a very gray zone, okay? The recommendations that um, we see and that we have to make a decision are based on a few things, which include the skill level of the teams, the score, the time, the events of the match. In addition, we have to keep in mind that we may have to adapt and change the position and as well keeping in mind that we need to stay away uh, from the play uh, without being getting involved. So reading players body language and getting set up for the next phase will be important. And the goal really is to use this downtime during set pieces to get ahead of play and um, use this downtime to position yourself for the next best location. So instead of taking a pause and relaxing, I suggest that you use this as kind of your key to success to getting um, to your next location, okay? So let's start from the beginning. Uh, we'll start with kickoff. So in kickoff, there's a couple of things we need to keep in mind. Um, what is the setup looking like? Are the teams looking to go long or are they looking to go short? Our main goal, as always, is to see the assistant referee, to see the ball, and then to envision and get ahead to see the next phase. In addition, we want to likely stay left of the ball. And as we are setting up with our team and we're taking our position, we can read player's position, team tactics, and body language, okay? What is the setup look like? This is a suggested image from IFAB. Um, you can see the referee is here. You can see my pointer with the red dot and the team in blue is kicking towards the bottom of the screen. So the suggested position is anywhere along this line, if you will, um, which is mobile. This lets us keep the ball on our left and the assistant in view as well, okay? So please ref remember this image as we continue to look at other stills and I will ask you to also have a vote soon, okay? Let's take a look. So here's a still similarly of a set piece, the kickoff, and the team in blue is kicking to the left. And we have one, two, three attackers that are somewhat comfortably um, in their location. They don't look eager to get advanced. And the team is set up similarly to the other team. They're pretty far back. Um, in a very laid back position, which would suggest the ball will perhaps stay in their side and they will possess. So the referee has positioned themselves here because they predict the next phase of play will be located in this area, okay? Now, if we contrast this a little bit more to this, we are gaining more attackers. So now we have one, two, three, four. So perhaps the referee is in a ready position to move forward as the ball is getting likely kicked in a longer situation forward. So the referee has to be prepared, okay? So although this may be the starting position, maybe we are ready to move quickly to the new position and anticipate a longer ball. Okay, 
Now, this image should jump out at you um, as it looks vastly different, okay? Um, so the team in the light green is kicking off. And if you notice, how many players do they have here on the line? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven players eager, maybe even a tad bit early, that are ready to jump the gun and attack, okay? So the likely area where it's traveling, the ball is traveling to is somewhere way up high across the field over here, okay? So if you notice, the referee has recognized this and has taken an advanced position to be ready for the next decision, which will likely be a long ball to an area over here, way advanced in front of the assistant, okay? Very different image than this, okay? So I want you to take a look at this image and given the considerations I've just shared with you, please take a minute to vote on where you would project yourself having learned a few things just now. So Katya, it's not letting me uh, do the polling, I think because of what we tried to do earlier. Okay, um, let's see if I can do throw you, it up. Do you have it? Uh, let me see if I can throw it up. Did it go up? Yeah, they see the poll. Okay. I'll give it another five seconds. Three, two, one. Okay. Are you seeing results, Richard? I am not. I am not either, actually. Oh, here they come. Okay. So most of you looks like would take my suggested position of perhaps area three, judging that there is one, two, three, four, five attacking players ready to run to the next phase. Maybe we as referees can position ourselves here while still being able to see the ball, the assistant referee, and as well really mediating the attackers and ensuring they're not taking off too early, okay? I know we may not be able to see this attacker, but we can have a verbal um, chat with him to ensure that he stays. But otherwise we should be able to position ourselves with our shoulders facing the assistant referee and the ball and have an open body language to see all of these attackers, okay? All right, good job. We'll go on to throw-in. So this may not be something we often think of as set piece, but um, in many teams are set piece specialists that are throwers and teams utilize this to their advantage, especially in the attacking third, to score goals. Um, a long throw-in can serve as just as great as a direct free kick, um, and it takes one header and the ball is in. So um, this is also something we can use to prepare for the next phase. As I mentioned before, it's important to keep an open body language to try to get as much in our view as possible, as many players, the assistant referee, as well as the ball and the thrower. Our goal is, as this throw in is taken, is to get an angle to see in between players. What we're looking for are elbows going up, any pushing, any unfair challenges. We need to also have a consideration for what the thrower's body language is and their abilities. Have they in the previous matches or in this current match shown capabilities of throwing the ball inside the penalty area or are they always throwing the ball backwards? So learning from within the match is helpful, okay? So here we have a position of B is the ball and the referee, okay? Um, and I will mark the area where from reading this play, the ball is going. As you can see, this is at midfield. Blue is attacking, and we have a few options for the thrower, okay? As a referee, 
in midfield and in the defensive one third when the team is throwing, we generally want to be ahead of the thrower, okay? Generally speaking. So here the referee is in a great position to see the ball as it likely travels to here or possibly the referee while in flight can adjust if the ball is traveling to this area, okay? This open position with the shoulders open towards this area allows us to see ball, future drop zone. In addition, in our periphery, our teammates, the assistant referee over here, okay? Here's an example of an attacking throw in. So as I mentioned, in the defensive and midfield, we maybe want to stay ahead of the thrower. As we get closer into the attack, that becomes more difficult for otherwise we would be in, involved with play and interfere with player space. So here we're almost in line with the thrower, the blue team, and he has many options in this area, okay? We are keeping an open view of all of these players as well as anyone that may be coming in, okay? In addition, key factor to consider as we get closer towards the penalty area is the penalty area is a special zone and it's a high priority area. Fouls in the penalty area are called penalty kicks and a high scoring opportunity. So we want to be close and proximal to control this area, okay? And this vertical line, if incidences occur here, are the responsibilities of the referee. So this is a great position to have credibility to see the throw in or any other incidents that may occur. Okay. So here is another example. The gray team will be throwing the ball in. This is an attack and the white team is defending. So I want you to take a moment and I will throw up the poll and please vote on the results here. We we'll give another five seconds for those that haven't gotten their answers in quite yet. Okay. Okay, so we have a little bit of a split between everyone. And as I mentioned before, there is no right or, correct, right or wrong answer. I want you to be thoughtful in the decisions you make. So here, ideally we would start in position two to possibly intervene with anything that may occur with this player um, and possibly intervene if we need to make any decisions on this vertical penalty area line. But we also have to be ready and move across quickly to spot one if the throw in is a little bit longer perhaps, okay? So a starting position at one location, number two, perhaps would be I ideal and then moving across if anything changes or adjusting, okay? So just because we pick one location to start does not mean we have to stay cemented in that location. We can move and adjust based on the game as long as we're using some of the considerations discussed, okay? In addition, we do have an assistant referee who can help us with some of this as well there. So use our teammates. Let's move on to this clip. So here we have a blue team that is throwing the ball in and the setup is a little bit different as there is multiple players inside the penalty area now. Okay, so let me throw up the polling. Okay, it should be up. I'll give you guys another couple of seconds to think this one through and vote. Three, two, one. Okay. Great. So it seems like the majority have picked position two. 
and let's talk about it. So here we have a few options, a short option, an option outside the penalty area. But what their goal really is, is to get this ball in a scoring position to this location, okay? So if the ball goes to this player, we would argue that they would immediately pass the ball to this location to have a scoring opportunity. So perhaps we might even be okay to immediately start in position two because we would be better able to control that second step, okay? So this would potentially be our phase one. And as the ball travels and we are in position two, we are able to better control and see for the penalty area decision for phase two, if you will, okay? So that was good coverage on throw-ins. Let's continue to move on to goal kicks. So as mentioned before, we need to discover and understand if the team is setting up for long or short, which we'll see examples of both. Um, we need to understand how the defensive shape is and the attacking shape is of the opposite team. If they're having high, medium, or low pressure, um, general team tactics, and then just a reminder with the new laws of the game changes, the defenders may receive the ball inside the penalty area, while the attackers, we, although they may remain inside the penalty area, we strongly encourage you to manage this and get the attackers outside. Um, if the attackers remain inside the penalty area, they're really not to challenge for the ball. Um, and I will cover more of this if you guys stay tuned in a few weeks for some of the law changes presentation, I believe in two to three weeks. So we can cover more of this. But here's a general suggested position for goal kicks. Uh, goal kick is coming towards the bottom of your screen. Here's the ball. Here's the referee. The future potential drop zone is in this area. And we have an open view to future drop zone our future assistant referee on the next half, as well as what is happening with the kick. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So here's a kick that's coming in. It's in the air now. Here is the setup. The referee is at midfield, waiting for the ball to drop in this area with an open view to the assistant referee as well. Okay. Pretty clear cut on this long goal kick, okay? Then we will continue to shorter options. So as the laws have changed, we're allowed to have defenders inside and they can receive the ball. Here we see three attackers nearby with some amount of pressure. So we have to be ready and adjust to this, okay? So we need to move our position so that we are prepared for any turnovers that occur and read this. Keys to this is to read how many attackers are wanting to put pressure, okay? Here we have three. So we need to adjust and move our position away from midfield and perhaps get in a position where my cursor is a little bit closer to this, okay? Just in case there is a turnover our distance to cover to get a decision inside the penalty area is shorter from here than it would be from the center circle, okay? Let's take a look at this. So this is a potential short ball as well, but we only have one attacker pressing. So we can continue to cheat a little bit even more upfield, okay? Because the pressure from the opposing team is very low, but also appears to be a short ball the way that these are set up and how the goalkeeper is standing near the ball, indicating that they want to pass it short, as opposed to the goalkeeper taking steps backwards and looking to wind up for a long ball. Okay. So here we have this. So as you can see, we don't quite see the referee in the picture for this, but the pressure exhibited by the white team is very low. So we can stay in this area, maybe just off the screen as referees. Okay, let's take a look at another clip. This is also a short goal kick.
Now what you will notice and hopefully noticed is immediately after the pass is made, there are three attackers here that are eagerly pressuring this ball. So we have a potential situation. We have, if the ball is turned over, we have one, two, three, V2, if the ball is turned over in this pressure. So we can no longer maintain our position near the center circle when this occurs. We need to move into a location somewhere around here, just at the edge of the screen, to have a view on this and be ready for a turnover. Okay, so here we see the referee is positioned well and is ready for any turnovers that occur, but is also then ready to continue on to their run when turnover does not occur. Okay, is that clear? We'll watch that clip again. I think it's a good clip. So the referee's position here, and if the turnover occurred, he would be able to, they would be able to sprint five, 10 yards to get in a better position to have a view of this incident. Okay. Okay, moving on right along to corner kicks. So this is a general concept for corner kicks, and it's truly the same if the corner kick is taken on the assistant side or the opposite side. Here we have our assistant um, helping with ball placement as well as managing the distance here um, of the defensive team and the referee's position here to have a clear view. This is the general starting point um, for us. Now let's take a look at some examples. So here we moved the ball to the other side. The ball is now on our left. And we have a lot of players, some on the post, the blue team is defending. And this is a general starting position for the referee. So independent of which side of the, is the corner, AR side or referee side, our general starting position is suggested somewhere within this vicinity, okay? So here's another clip for um, with two players set up here, uh, assistant referee, ball, and then we notice a lot of players, okay? So generally we are okay to start here and manage as long as we are, one, ready to move and adjust when the ball is in flight um, from any of our positions where we start to a new position and read the play. And B, really importantly, to read the play and staying out of the player's way, okay? Let's take a look at another clip and I'll let you guys vote. So here we have the black team is attacking and please have a vote in regard to where you believe their best position for the referee is. And I'm gonna close the poll here in five seconds. Three, two, one. Beautiful, okay. So yeah, majority agree that we can start in position one. Position one will allow us to, sur to see this ball come across and look in between most of these matchups, okay? Perhaps this is a matchup your assistant referee can see, but for the most part, from position one, we can see the greater picture and open our bodies up with shoulders, hopefully facing the goal line to see the most and be open to the most incidences. We're looking to see in between players. Once the ball is in the air, we want to stay light on our toes and adjust our small position with small little movements as the ball is in flight and players make runs, okay? So important to have a good starting position, but also adjust and be agile on your toes and movement, okay? This is a similar clip. Um, I will just go over it without a, a, a poll. But here, the difference is we have a lot more players inside the six there, inside the goal area. So these players can potentially interfere with the goalkeeper. Uh, we can have a lot more difficult decisions 
And so while we start in position one, maybe we want to get a better angle and take a few steps towards the penalty area, inside the penalty area, maybe to our left, this way, to get a better view on this. The danger of staying in position two, while it may seem like the best view, is position two, and really this entire arc, is a high traffic zone for players. One, the defensive team wants to clear the ball away, and oftentimes they either head the ball directly this way, or they kick it through this region. And on the counterpart, the attackers, the white team, they want to score. So if the ball pops out anywhere through here, they are eager to take shots in this region. So nothing good happens if you're a stationary inside this D, commonly referred to, this semicircle, okay? So if we are caught being in the D, I suggest we get across it. We need to be moving through this area, okay? Because a lot of bad things can happen through this. We can touch the ball or be in the way and cause problems for the players. We would interfere with play and players' positions and their zones if we are in this area, okay? So I reiterate, we can be in this as long as we are moving across it quickly, but stationary position in this area should be a no-no. Okay. This is a similar clip. I will move on to the next one for the sake of time. And I will actually have you guys vote on this. So let me relaunch poll two. So pick position one, two, three, please, based on the setup and based on what we talked about. And five more seconds, and I will end the poll. Okay, good. So the majority again picked poll uh, position number two which is a great starting position. Now let's watch what happens with this clip. Okay, let's take a look at this clip. I'm not sure how many of you guys expected that, but let's examine this. So the ball travels short to a player that's checking in and the referee is very far on the backside, okay? Very far. So she is having to look through all of these players, 10 players, and has no clear view of this situation, okay? So perhaps this is too wide of a position and we didn't anticipate the correct way when the ball was played. So while the referee maybe started in an okay position, we did not adjust as the ball was played in, okay? A better movement would be to start in this location, but then perhaps come across you can come across all the way if you can. I argue you don't have time for that, but come across to an area where you can see this. So perhaps right on the edge here and be able to view this better, okay? The referee ends up in an okay position, but she gets a little bit lucky. This is a dangerous area. We have a very bad view for any handling or any fouls that may occur as that player dribbles in. Okay, so I hope that helps with corner kicks. Um, now let's see, we, I'd like to get to set pieces and see how many of these we can get to before time runs out. So uh, we'll talk to set pieces um, in detail and um, the important factors we need to consider is determining priorities uh, as a team. So priorities include the ball, the wall, the future drop zone, as well as the offside and the second to last defender, which we often 
correlate that to the assistant referee. So we need to ask ourselves who can help and is it possible for us to assign roles to some of these? Um, is an assistant referee perhaps able to help you with uh, the wall or help you with location of the ball placement? And for sure they should be able to help you with an offside, posi uh, offside position. And let's, we'll take a look and see what the expected trajectory of the ball is. Is a shot going long or short? Is it a shot or is it a cross? Okay. So a lot of questions we need to ask ourselves. Team tactics, location and block of players. How many block of players are there? How many walls are set up? Player's body language, right or left foot kicker, as well as steps to control the restart. So the restart includes taking control of the kicker, ensuring that we have a good signal that is clear to the kicker, perhaps also the goalkeeper, ensuring the ball is in a good location, setting up the wall, prevention to the wall, prevention meaning ensuring that they're aware if their hands are outside their silhouette, if you will, that they are at risk of having a handball offense called against them, and then getting ready ourselves, positioning. So that was a mouthful for set pieces, so a lot to consider. So let's take a look at one set piece um, in this game from the beginning, okay? I'll play this in full first, and then we will discuss it and kind of dissect it in some details, okay? Now we're less concerned about the foul or referee's position to start with, but more concerned about um, everything it takes after the whistle is blown. Okay, let's take a look at this clip. So I'm gonna fast forward to when the foul is called. So here we are. The foul is for the white team. And currently there are no white players in this region. We as referee have now inserted ourselves into the situation and have involved speaking to the gray players as well as pointing to the location of the spot. So from this point forward, this becomes a ceremonial. Once we insert ourselves into a situation, it is expected that the kick is now ceremonial, meaning we take ownership of it and it's restarted with a whistle, okay? So as the white prayer approaches, it's important to make eye contact with them to ensure that they're able to place the ball in the correct location as well as communicating with them that the restart will be on your whistle, okay? Commonly, and I suggest we use a signal to put our hands in front, avoid putting our hands above our head to signal to the whistle that the ball will be restarted on the whistle. In addition, this is also a key feature for the goalkeeper as they are busy setting up their defensive wall, okay? so. The referee can stay in this area and manage this kick now that they have intervened. So stay in the area, find a good location for the ball, and here, take this moment, take this time to look at the white player in the eyes, wait for them to get up and get good eye contact with them to ensure that they're not kicking early and the communication loop is received, okay? Because this is information for them they make us look bad if they start early. The whistle is not for the attacker. The whistle is for the white player and perhaps the goalkeeper, okay? So we can put it in front of our face to indicate this, but we need to also ensure that the best way to communicate is to have good eye contact with the kicker, okay? The reason we don't want to put the whistle above our head is this can commonly be confused with a signal for indirect free kick. 
So I suggest you keep it shoulder level, uh, point to the whistle with your hand at that level, okay? So as we proceed forward into this video, notice that the referee has now turned their back towards the ball and perhaps 20 if he wished or desired to can move the ball anywhere, okay? So try to have an open view of this. Um, you can try to communicate to your assistant referee to keep an eye on the ball as you're walking as well if this is difficult, okay? But common practice in pregame can include, hey, if I'm setting up for a free kick, would you mind please looking at the location of the ball and letting me know if the attacking team has moved the ball, okay? So as we move forward, we have our good distance and the wall is set up, okay? Now he's not listening to you, so he, we also want to communicate to him to stay there and make sure that we have direct communication and contact. So proper communication helps, okay? And the last step is for us to read clues as to how this is going to be set up, okay? Now we have a block of players in this area. We have a player here, and we have the goal here. So unlikely that this will be a shot directly to goal, more than likely, given the distance, this will be a cross wafted somewhere into this region. So we would want to position ourselves to have the best zone view of this region here, okay? Um, the people, assistant referee can help with this if there is an issue. And if the ball is played short this way, we can be mobile and adjust our run as well, okay? And as we saw, the ball went to the predicted drop zone. I know that's a lot to consider in free kicks, but remember, we control the restart, we control when we are ready for it. So take your time, go through the steps, but more importantly, also go out and practice on a field and communicate as if you would to the players as well, okay? So here we have another set piece. There is a kicker here for the blue team. A wall is set up. And then we have a large drop zone of potential matchups, okay? Remember, we want to see in between players. And as the ball gets dropped to this region, we want to have the best view of this, okay? Now, you may ask, what about the wall? What about the encroachment? What about a possible, possible handling? This is a very good question. We have an assistant referee that's off the screen over here who can help us if there is possible encroachment or possible handling, okay? I also argue that our priority is for fouls inside the penalty area as they have a higher direct outcome for scoring. And so we sometimes have to sacrifice a little bit of other things like the wall to get a better view and control and management of the future penalty area decisions, okay? Because penalty kicks are not forgiven. Perhaps small encroachment from the wall is something that people would forgive them a, a little bit more. But a mistake in the penalty area that is game critical is less likely to be forgotten, okay? So let's take a look at a few more clips. So as I mentioned, this is the drop zone we're looking to be. Try to have an open view as this referee does with shoulders open to see all the players and maybe a tad bit back to be able to see a little bit more of the wall and then run in as necessary, okay? But this is not a, a bad starting position as long as we move, okay? Here's another location. Now, if you notice, the biggest difference now is that the wall has moved inside the penalty area. So our priority changes. The wall that could potentially handle the ball as a shot is taken is inside the penalty area and would result in a penalty kick, okay? So this we must see. So this must be priority number one for us, okay? 
the block of players is perhaps a secondary priority, okay? So when we're setting up to see this, which is likely going to be a shot, given the setup, the distance, um, and limited attackers really in the view, we must be able to see the wall, okay? And as a reminder, if there is an attacker um, in a wall that is three or more players, they must maintain a distance of one meter or one yard. So future shot, okay. So here we have a shot, a uh, free kick from further away. And we have a long, 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 long block of players. Very difficult. Okay, now you notice a referee has set up over here. So the referee is likely anticipating the ball to be dropped into this region, okay. And Perhaps this is not an ideal solution because we are looking through many players to get to this. A better position would be through here and adjust and see in between players to see the holds, to see any potential incidents that are right in between players, okay? We'll do a few more and then I will conclude. Okay, so I will have you guys vote on this. I will do the setup. So the team in yellow and pink is attacking and they are set up for this incident. Please take a second and decipher what you believe is the best position. By a vote. So remember, the keys for this, the wall is inside. Can this be a shot from this area? How many goals do you see scored from this? Or is this going to be a cross? In addition, remember, we have an assistant referee in this region as well who can perhaps help us, who we can delegate responsibility to. Okay, I'm going to end the poll here. Oh, interesting. Okay. So we have a mixed review of results, almost a three-way split. Um, so let's talk through some things. This is a wall that is immediately in the eyesight of the assistant referee. So any handling on the side or above would be noted by the assistant referee. So they are a teammate we can count on and relinquish this responsibility. Okay. So then the next focus for us becomes the next phase. Well, this is likely going to be a cross. So the cross would be aimed at this block of players. Okay, so for us, it's important to position ourselves to view in between these players. Hold on a second, sorry. Uh, to view in between these players as they are running, to look at any holding, to prevent any fouls, and to be a vocal leader and manage these players. And I would argue our best position would be somewhere almost at one or two to get the best view of this. If we are at position three, we are a bit too far from the action and we are a bit too far to have any vocal influence on the block of players, okay? If we are at position three, it just puts us a little bit further away from the next phase, okay? While we can maybe see the wall, we are then not ready for what happens consequently, okay? I will stop there and answer any questions that may have come up. Wayne, have you guys noticed anything in chat that you would like to bring up? Uh, everything, seems, everything seems pretty clean here, uh, Katja. You're doing a great job. Okay. Um, then I will conclude if there's no questions, unless I will give you guys a moment to think of any questions um, if you come up with anything, and I'm happy to answer them.
Okay, if there's no questions, I will um, make the presentation available as well as some of the other slides. We did not go over more on the positioning and set pieces. Um, if you guys want on the, uh, with the help of Wayne on the Washington webpage, hope you enjoyed it and we look forward to seeing you guys next Monday. Okay, thank you again for joining us. Uh, Katja, great job. Um, just a reminder, we'll be on again next week. Uh, and uh, Philippe Dorr will be talking about challenges, specifically lower uh, body challenges. So we look forward to having you. And thank you again, everyone.